In the brilliant sunshine of a modern-day Manitoba springtime, the colorful past of prairie York boats, steamboats, and diesels has almost faded away, washed by a sparkle of foam lost in the wake of a river torrent. For more than a century, the inland waterways of Manitoba were the lifeblood of a major transportation industry. Boats and fortunes were made and lost in an unpredictable northern climate that barely allowed half a year of unfrozen water to float on. It's hard to remember now, in this day of highways, rail and air routes, that for all those decades, the only freight and public transportation in the north was by the boats that plied its rivers and lakes. Though today that industry has all but disappeared, the Marine Museum in Selkirk is building a treasure house devoted to a fascinating chapter in Manitoba history. Aboard the boats of the Marine Museum, at their final anchor at last, surrounded by lawns now instead of waves, every visitor on every trip can find something new to bring that past to life once again. The Kenora, the Bradbury, the Pegwis, the Chikema. For some it means rediscovering old memories and an experience shared. For others, it's the magic of imagination the best opportunity for learning there can be. They were all steamboats in the early days, burning wood to heat the huge boilers that supplied steam to the chugging pistons, which in turn drove the paddle wheels and later propellers. Northerners paid for their isolation tree by tree a forest of trees to feed the flames, 60 cords of birch a week for one of the big boats like the Kenora, traveling a route that would begin on a Monday in Selkirk, then on to Hecla, Gull Harbor, Pine Dock, Matheson Island, Barron's River, Warren's Landing, across the lake to Grand Rapids, returning down to Barron's into Matheson, Gull Harbor, and Hecla again, sometimes across to Victoria Beach or to Gimli, then into Winnipeg for a Sunday cruise on the river before returning home. 120 tons of logs a season went up the Kenora's stacks in billows of smoke that advertised her coming from miles away. And whole communities would be waiting in celebration at the shore when she would arrive on her first trip in the springtime. For with no roads or rails, there would have been no fresh fruit or vegetables for over six months, no mail, nor news of the outside world. But with the return of the boats might appear almost anything. One of the old deckhands remembers a fancy Lincoln automobile brought on board. Fresh groceries, sewing fabric, livestock, building supplies, ice cream, and of course, the tourists even in the early days, perhaps from far off New York or Texas. The Kenora outlived them all. Prefabricated in Quebec, the pieces assembled in Kenora, Ontario in 1897, she was later brought west to Winnipeg in sections, where 40 feet more length was added, and she served for a time as a floating dance hall. At 150 feet long, she continued to adapt to changing times, as increased northern development inspired her owners to tear out passenger cabins to make way for more cargo. She burned wood for steam right through to the 1950s, when for a brief period the boilers were converted to use coal. Finally, diesel engines took their place. Within a year, the last smokestacks on Lake Winnipeg were gone for good. By that time, the competition between transport by water and travel by land and air was over, and the boats had lost the race. And time for the Kenora was running out. Five years after her diesel engines went in, she was retired to a Selkirk slough. It was through the efforts of a dedicated group of men and women that she was restored to service as a museum committed to preserving the history of prairie boating and the people who had lived it.
other boats had not fared as well as the Kenora. All that's left of the granite rock today are a few fragments salvaged from a rotting wreck. Once one of the most familiar sights on Lake Winnipeg, her dark green hull trimmed in red, black coal smoke blowing from her funnel, towing her lumber barge day in and day out for the Brown and Rutherford Company, she avoided the Lake Winnipeg reefs for over 50 years. It was the shifting sands of a declining economy that did her in. The Bradbury began as a government ship in 1915. For a short time, she was owned by a Winnipeg businessman, but after lying idle for 17 years, from 1935 to 1952, she was recommissioned by the federal government and continued with her official duties until 1973, entertaining dignitaries, delivering treaty payments, acting as a lighthouse tender, setting out buoys and markers, and carrying pickerel and whitefish spawn, stocking the lake for the commercial fishing industry. An unusual element in her construction was a wrought iron hull, fastened with rivets due to difficulties in welding. Outside that, a tough, resilient layer of rock elm equipped her for her other official job as icebreaker. Her history records numerous accounts of valor and distinction. In 1917, she broke through half a foot of ice while carrying doctors and medicine to a settlement which had been struck by a flu epidemic. Up north, beyond Warren's Landing, lay shallow Playgreen Lake. To negotiate its unpredictable channels required a flatter-bottomed kind of boat, and for this, the Chikema was perfect. Chikema, a Cree word meaning, of course, was also the perfect name for a boat that could handle almost any cargo as a matter of course with her two 80-ton capacity barges. With a typical load of 40 tons of flour for Norway House, and another 40 bound for Cross Lake in 25-pound bags all handled by hand, there was plenty of work for a crew at each stopover, not to mention regular Tuesday cleanups and brass polishing, but where there's pride in the work, any job goes easier. The boat crews weren't the only ones with a job to do on the lakes. As fast as the mud and the sand could fill in a channel, the dredges and their crews would clear it out again. Tugboats were used for dredge tenders, and what every tug needed was someone who could treat her right. Even today, these engines from the Pegwis II glow with the pride of a conscientious engineer. As a matter of fact, there's a good chance they might still run if one day a ghost of a breeze from the lake came calling and woke them to life once more. Every boat in service owed its life to the people who worked on it. The Kenora's crew numbered up to 26 in tourist season, with at least six young waitresses and cabin cleaners, two cooks with two assistants, four freight handlers, two engineers with two boiler assistants, the purser, the watchman, and the captain and mate with a wheelsman each. What they remembered most was the feeling of being one big family. When they got to the wood docks, even the captain was out on the wood pile throwing wood with the rest of them. And when the 100 or so passengers gathered in the lounge for an afternoon sing-along, some of the crew would be sure to join in. Well, I, I uh, must say that uh, on the Kenora it was all hard work, every bit of it. We earned every gold and nickel that we got. And, uh, but yet, at the same time, we, uh, we had our uh, moments, you know, fun at the, at the same time. I, I don't know, there, there seems to be a difference in the, in the young people nowadays. Uh, uh, they always seem to be so tired for some reason. <laughs> well, well we, could, we, could work, uh, we could work until... Uh, uh, well, uh, late at night, yeah. and then we could maybe dance until uh, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning and then be back to work 6 o'clock like nothing. Now, only the echoes of those people who worked hard and played hard can be found in a quiet moment in a forgotten corner.
from the wheelhouse window, you might imagine coming face to face with the top of a wave 25 feet high in an 86 mile an hour gale off Victoria Beach. Or then there was the time the captain's son woke up in his father's cabin to see his suitcase standing straight up on the far wall of the room. A storm on Lake Winnipeg can last 15 minutes or three days and make any person wonder which way is up, although surprisingly few lives were lost on the big boats. And so they kept on sailing through the storms and the droughts and depression as the roads were built up along the shores of the lake and the airplane service improved. The waves that once danced to a fiddler's hornpipe from a steamboat deck now watch jets soar far overhead. But at the Marine Museum in Selkirk, Manitoba, the rescue of a precious heritage is underway. So come once and you'll want to return to the magic of the boats and their colorful past. Thank you.